We thank God once again for yet another opportunity to continue with the second part of our discussion of the last great crisis. And so we started by talking about the fact that um, in Daniel chapter 12 verse 1, at that time of trouble, at that time, sorry, shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. That is in Daniel chapter 12 verse um, 1. And then of course, um, in the spirit of prophecy, we are told that the last great conflict will be short but terrible. We also looked at the fact that all these crises are to fall upon the earth in order to further an agenda. In order to further an agenda. And then, of course, we looked at that agenda in Revelation chapter 13, um, verse number 15 and 16, to cause the earth to receive the mark of the beast. That is the rationale behind this whole crisis, which is to fall upon the earth. Of course, we are to also understand that the crisis covers the entire sphere of the world, as we liken it to the case of Egypt, where there was famine across the earth. And of course, there was nowhere to go but in Egypt. But in Egypt. So in this case, as the brothers of Joseph had no other place than Egypt, the Bible says that and he that is the second beast will cause all to receive the mark of the beast and that no man may buy or sell save he that has the mark so that is to tell you that the whole universe is to go through the exact farming situation that occurred during um, um the days of joseph in Egypt, the famine that occurred in Egypt. And so this is what we have been told, that we are to experience unprecedented crisis in the world. So, this news item, we begin with this um, news item, which is very, very, very interesting and very, very important that we look at it. Tower of Babel, um, it's a Dutch um, news item. Tower of Babel, the Great Depression 2.0 will trigger the world's greatest financial catastrophe this is what this news item tells us and of course the date is um 21st march 2022 and so it reads the world is reportedly heading for a second edition of the great depression so we have had the great De depression long ago and then we are told that the world is heading towards the second edition but the coming financial crash now let's see because the setting up of the mark of the beast has an economic component and that is why this news item tells us that we are going to experience a financial crash a financial meltdown where humanity inadvertently will lose everything we will be impoverished so i want you to understand cast your minds back to the days um, of joseph and his brothers where there was famine they had absolutely nothing that is the situation that the world will be going into it's it, it further reads but the but, but the coming financial crash will surpass anything we have seen in human history. You hear that? It will surpass anything. And that is why Daniel did not mince words when he said, A time of trouble such has never was since there was a nation. Very clear. It's as if this new item has read the book of Daniel before. So that is what we are heading towards. British analyst Jeff Thomas, writing for International Man Magazine, argues that the future financial crash will be far worse than people can imagine it will be far worse than we can imagine it venerates is a stock market crash imminent because history teaches us that every crash has been preceded by explosive rising margin debts the 2008 crash was actually a mini crash ladies and gentlemen i want us to get this picture very well in 2008 there was a crash there was a financial crash. 
Now this news item tells us that it was a mini. It was a miniature crash. No correction has ever taken place. Instead, it was prepared over by a massive increase in depth, ensuring that when the inevitable big crash did okay, you see, the inevitable, it is inevitable, it is certain. Let me put it that way. Ensuring that when the inevitable big crash did okay, the severity would be far in excess of any other crash in history. And that is why Daniel points us that it is a time of trouble. That is what Daniel describes it as time of trouble. When the expected crash will when the expected crash will okay remains uncertain. It is certain that it will happen. And so last year during the World Government Summit, Dr. Pippa Malgrin who happens to be a global elite, part of the global elite, talked about it. And she said, it is going to be painful. Why is it going to be painful? Let's hear her speak. Well, it may be a bit late for that. Uh, I remember talking to an Australian diplomat at one point about this break between the US and China and said, you know, both sides are going to say, whose team are you on? Mm. And he said, our job is to make sure the question never arises. But the question has arisen. And so I think we have to go deeper. And it's not about the US versus China. It's about what underpins a world order is always the financial system. Mm. I, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71. And so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having a almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, mm -hmm. which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private. But what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The US is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life? Because that's the only measure of whether a world order really serves. All right, so we've had, had talked about the fact that it is going to be very, very painful. That is to say, people are going to lose so much wealth. That is the point. The economy will just go down. There's going to be a crash almost everywhere. And we are just going to lose everything. And so they describe it that you own nothing. But you'll be happy. Now the question we are asking is that which areas will be affect affected? Are we going to see just economic or financial crisis? The answer is no. In fact, the World Economic Forum, we can see that recently this forum has really become very prominent it has been there for years but recently it has become very prominent and a lot of people are talking about it and they are speaking on so many issues and it is very interesting that they predicted the pandemic a year ago and it happened it just happened let's watch this video
in healthy looking pigs months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. The event 201 scenario is fictional. Today's scenario is going to simulate meetings of a multi-stakeholder group called the Pandemic Emergency Board. This board has been urgently convened by the World Economic Forum. This meeting of some of the world's most powerful elite took place in 2019. We're at the start of what's looking like it will be a severe pandemic. And there are problems emerging that can only be solved by global business and governments working together. The mission? To provide recommendations to deal with the major global challenges arising in response to an unfolding pandemic. Less than 12 months later, and... Stay at home, that is the order tonight from four state governors as the coronavirus pandemic spread. Well, so we've seen the prediction made by them just a year in 2019. And it came to pass. So it is not a small fish. So we need to take them serious. But why must we take the things that they say more seriously? Because their leader, that is Klaus Schwab, has connection with the Jesuits. And the Jesuits constitute the military arm of the papacy. He has connection with the Jesuits. And it isn't surprising that it has come to the fore right now. And almost anyone who is quote unquote important in the world today is affiliated to the World Economic Forum, including prominent presidents like Justin Trudeau, like Emmanuel Macron. And Klaus Schwab tells us that those he has trained form more than half of all cabinets in the world. Very interesting. Let's hear from your doctor. All right. Well, here is a question for you. Why has the World Economic Forum been so amazingly successful? The World Economic Forum, founded by Klaus Schwab, is not just a benign organization that pushes agenda items like transhumanism, 15-minute cities, the end of combustion engines, climate lockdowns, digital currency, the elimination of cash, the elimination of sovereign governments. This is basically what they they want, right? It would be one thing if all of these items were just pie in the sky ideas, but it's quite another thing how all of these things are actually coming to pass. Many governments have been implementing many of their policies, uh, not just in the United States, but in France and New Zealand and Canada and Australia, Ireland, the Netherlands. The list is actually frighteningly long. How does this happen? How did they get so strong? Well, it turns out that the World Economic Forum has a very good farm system. You know, it's like uh, Major League Baseball and the minor league baseball teams. Like they, they farm it out and they get them, they start them young. A grooming program, if you will, called the Young Global Leaders of the World Economic Forum. Now, we've covered this a bit on the show, but I want to do more of a deep dive now because what they do is they seek you out. They groom you. They place you into this program. Here's There's just one caveat. You need to be young. You need to be 40 or under so that you can then infiltrate these governments and do the bidding of the World Economic Forum. It's like a kid's club. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. It's like, okay, you know, we're getting you started young. We're getting you started so you can be indoctrinated and then rise up inside of this organization. Now, the, the expose uh, did a great job cataloging just a few of these World Economic Forum young leaders who ended up infiltrating these governments and then running the show, basically. Schwab has openly admitted that these young global leaders are infiltrating governments around the world. And he gloats about it, by the way. Um, so let's just start with Justin Trudeau as an example here, the Prime Minister of Canada, dictator uh, Justin Trudeau. Here's Klaus Schwab praising Trudeau, one of his young protégés. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brez of uh, Argentina and so on, so we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau and I would know that half of this cabinet or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet 
are for our actually young global leaders of the world economic right. form. Isn't that sick and disgusting? That's just one example in Canada. A member of the young global leader class of 2020, well, very, very young, Sana Marin, who became the world's youngest serving prime minister when she took office in 2019 in Finland. She's uh, been a vocal advocate of all sorts of crazy progressive policies, um, obviously climate change. And, uh, perhaps worst of all is Emmanuel Macron. Of course, there he is standing next to his buddy, uh, Klaus Schwab. Uh, he was a member of the young global leadership class of 2016. So reducted, so reducted is to tell us the impact that the World Economic Forum has made. But we must also understand that again, it is the puppet of the papacy. It is doing the bidding of the papacy. And that is why they know what is going to happen. Because it is planned. It is cooked. So let's watch this video to indeed affirm the origin and the roots of the World Economic Forum. The Missing Link surfaces at last. New video of Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum connecting the dots between revolution in the Catholic Church 60 years ago and the Great Reset. And what's the connection between the global lockdowns of today and a bizarre middle of the night ceremony that took place some 55 years ago deep in the catacombs beneath the streets of Rome? The plot thickens tonight from the editor's desk. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we have an interesting show. Pretty stunning video, actually, uh, later on in the show of none other than Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, the ultimate lunatic of Davos, personally connecting all the dots between the revolution in the Catholic Church 60 years ago and the Great Reset, incredibly. I almost can't believe it myself after months sitting here week after week, contending that the first Great Reset took place 60 years ago in the Catholic Church in something called the Second Vatican Council. And now along comes Klaus Schwab confirming our contention that that is exactly the case. Before we get to that, we have to talk about the bizarre middle-of-the-night ritual that took place beneath the streets of Rome way back in 1965. It was called the Catacombs Pact. 92-year-old Father Luigi Batazzi is the last known survivor of a secret pact that experts say may have influenced Pope Francis. Signed 50 years ago at the time of Vatican II by Catholic bishops in this underground church in Rome. Called the Pact of the Catacombs, it vowed to create a poor church for the poor. The same church Pope Francis says he wants today. Finally, I've teased it long enough. What does this have to do with Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, Davos and the Great Reset? Well, to answer that, we ask one more question. Who was the mastermind behind the Catacombs Pact? The guy who led the Council Fathers of Vatican II down under the streets of Rome to declare war on the old church. Who was that? Our young Italian friend in the video clip just named him. Around 40 mm -hmm. Council Fathers. One of those was, as I said, Helder Camara. Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? We'll slow it down and play it one more time. Helder Camara. Mm -hmm. Helder Camara. Bishop Helder Camara, or Camara, to anglicize it. He was born in 1909. He died 90 years later. An extremely influential person in South America and in the church in general. The self-identified socialist, Archbishop from Brazil, whom Francis would declare a servant of God in 2015. He's an advocate of liberation theology, of course. He's the Bishop of the Slums. <laughs> Starting to sound familiar? Well, it should. He is the role model of one Jorge Mario Bergoglio. He attended all four sessions of the Second Vatican Council and even played a significant role in drafting Gaudium et Spes, one of the 16 document documents of Vatican II, on the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world. And yes, it was Archbishop Camara who on November 16, 1965, 
led 42 powerful council fathers, bishops, down into the catacombs to sign the Catacombs Pact. Here's a bit more on that. And they also vowed to put pressure on international organizations to help change the economic structures which they said exploit the poor. These are all points that are remarkably similar to Pope Francis's agenda for the church today. Francis hit the ground running with the Catacombs Pact. I was there. I was in Rome. I was in the Vatican when this happened. I was in the Paul VI audience hall that very day. Francis was rolling out the catacombs pact right before our eyes. This was, of course, the brainchild of a socialist archbishop with Marxist sympathies. And so you're asking, understandably, what's the connection to Klaus Schwab? Finally, come on. Well, here it is. Archbishop Kamara, council father, one of the authors of Gaudium et Spes, revolutionary personality who's responsible for the catacombs pact. He's got one more point on his resume. <laughs> He was a major influence on a young Klaus Schwab. I, I give you one example, which for me was probably a crucial moment in my life. I traveled for the first time uh, to Brazil. I met a priest uh, who was known at that time as the priest of the poor people. Hmm. Uh, his name was Don Elder Camara. And he brought me to the favelas of uh, Recife, and I was so shocked. And I said, I have to invite this bishop to Davos mm. to tell the people what poverty is. So I invited him to, to, to the annual meeting in Davos. But some when I came back in Switzerland, I found out that actually he was forbidden at that time Ooh. to speak in Switzerland because he was considered to be a communist, and I said, this is for me a test. But then I noticed that many companies told me, if you invite this person who is so much against business, we will not come to Davos anymore. And that's where I had to stand to my values. Yeah. Even at the risk that I would have to give up uh, the World Economic Forum. Wow. Um, but it went very well. Uh, I have to say, um, the audience in Davos listened to him. So what we're talking about here is one of the council fathers and a speaker at Davos. The guys who are setting up the World Economic Forum, the Great Reset, and the New World Order. He was one of them, ladies and gentlemen. And they also vowed to put pressure on international organizations to help change the economic structures which they said exploit the poor. These are all points that are remarkably similar to Pope Francis's agenda for the church today. It's the same revolution. It's the same players, in fact. The Great Reset was indeed hatched in a catacomb beneath the streets of Rome at the close of the Second Vatican Council in 1965. And it just took a while to get to the point politically where it is now. But it's the same movement. And so it is an undeniable fact that the World Economic Forum is a puppet of the Vatican. And so strange things are going to happen. And of course, in the World Economic Forum um, Global Risk Report in this year, this year 2023, they give us a clear picture of what we are to expect to happen in the world. And so, this picture that you see on the screen tells us what we are likely to see in the next two years. It tells us. Very, very interesting. Very, very, very interesting picture. Now we see adverse outcomes. And they are all connected. Because they are plan a planned collapse that we are likely to see. So we see 
adverse outcomes of frontier technologies, digital power concentration, digital inequalities, breakdown of critical information infrastructure, use of weapons of mass destruction. You hear nuclear war tones, rumors going on, widespread cyber crime and cyber insecurity. Now, that is very, very, very sensitive issue that we'll be talking about. Terrorist attacks, misinformation and disinformation, state collapse, interstate conflict, geo-economic confrontation, ineffectiveness of multilateral institutions, natural disasters and extreme weather, large-scale involuntary migration, proliferation, proliferation of illicit economic activity, erosion of social cohesion, severe mental health deterioration, infectious diseases, chronic health conditions, employment crisis, collapse or lack of public infrastructure and services, prolonged economic downturn, failure to stabilize price trajectories, debt crisis, cost of living crisis, asset bubble bursts, collapse of a systematically important supply chain, failure to stabilize price trajectories, environmental damage incidents, failure to mitigate climate change, biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse, natural resource crisis. So the World Economic Forum gives us a clear picture of what we are going to see in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been told from the spirit of prophecy, and that is going to be my last quote for this discussion. The spirit of prophecy tells us so clearly that for fear of wanting food and clothing, the spirit of prophecy is very clear. That for fear, in Maranatha, page 160, paragraph 4, for fear of wanting food and clothing, they will join with the world in transgressing God's law. This is the agenda to deprive humanity of basic necessities so that we can be controlled and coerced into accepting a system that will lead to our total and eternal ruin. May God help us to clearly understand and also get to know how we can avoid this situation in Jesus' name. Amen.